we have coming to the show Callum Patton. He is a new contributor for the United Kingdom with Young Voices. He is a trainee lawyer and has been a writer for more than 10 years, including authoring a book called 2020 As It Happened on the coronavirus pandemic. He is a director of The Speaker, a political media outlet which provides political educational resources to schools across the UK. I am so honored to bring Callum to the show. Good morning, sir. How are you? Hi, I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me have, for having me on. Oh, my pleasure. It's so nice to meet you. I love the crew at Young Voices. You guys are awesome. And I'm just so glad to have you come to the show. Are you currently in the UK as we speak? I am, yeah. I'm based based in London. Oh, I love London. Absolutely <laughs> love London. Absolutely love London. Well, I'll tell you what. I would love first to hear your perspective on you know, midterm elections and what's going on here in the United States. What are your initial thoughts as you looked at all the headlines this morning? Yeah, I mean, initially, it seems like the Democrats had a better night than expected. Um, you know, that the, the red wave that we were sort of expecting was going to happen didn't really happen. It looks like, um, like as, as we stand at the moment, it looks like they might held on to the Senate, um, which for them is a, you know, a very strong result that was not really expected at all. And the Republican gains in the House have not really been as uh, significant as many predicted. Mm -hmm. And I think probably the biggest takeaway, actually, of anything is that Trump has probably lost his grip on the Republican Party. Um, I noticed um, just before I joined you in talking about DeSantis, and it seems yeah. that really he is now um, that lead figure for the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. All of those um, Trump endorsed candidates really underperformed what was expected. And um those comments that he made about DeSantis last week probably um, have actually loosened Trump's grip on the party and given DeSantis a much stronger foothold when we look towards the um, towards the next election in two years time. Well, I completely agree with you. I don't know if you noticed, but we didn't see Trump having to endorse DeSantis. We didn't see him around the campaign whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And DeSantis carried his own. You know, I, I said the quote where woke goes to die is exactly what Florida is. And, you know, my favorite, one of my favorite quotes from last night, we had the conviction to guide us. We had the courage to lead. And you don't see that from too many leaders across the nation. And, you know, I keep saying on this show, the show is about truth. It's about God, country, family. And we are looking for a leader. We clearly do not have a leader currently in the White House right now. But I tell you what, we got a powerful leader down in Florida and people were chanting two more years last night when he was doing <laughs> two years. Yeah, when he was giving yeah. his speech. But let me ask you this. Uh, you wrote a couple articles, obviously, about a week or so ago, and I'm very interested to hear your thoughts on your views of the United States economy as you pose in this article with regards to what is happening in Parliament. Could you break it down for our audience? Our audience is very conservative. So yeah. if you could break that down. That would be huge for me. Thank you. Yeah. Well, firstly, um, picking up on your your point about truth, I think that's actually quite an important takeaway from yesterday as well, in the sense that um, DeSantis tended, he, he's obviously very conservative in many of his views, quite similar to Trump, but he seems to, you know, exist in the real world. And I think that's something that is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, that's essentially where, where my article is coming from as well, because um, you had for the midterms the commitment to America plan, which was um, obviously not too uh, heavy in detail, but it was very clear in the sense of it was a very much tax cutting deregulatory plan for if and when the Republicans control Congress. Mm -hmm. It's quite similar to what we had here um, a couple of months ago with um, the mini budget that Liz Truss implemented or tried to implement when she took over as prime minister. Mm -hmm. And that was essentially cutting some of the, um, cutting the top rate of tax, cutting various other personal taxes and cutting uh, corporation tax as well. Now here that tended, that ended up failing quite badly because the markets reacted really badly to um, the statement and to the budget when it was announced. Mm -hmm. And the main reason for that was that it didn't really exist in the real world. It didn't adhere to um, sort of what was actually happening in the wider economy. Mm -hmm. So we've had um, inflation, which topped 11 percent here very recently. We've had interest rates rising throughout the year, which are now 
uh, 3%, which I think is still still lower than you've got over there. Mm-hmm. Um, and what happened is that this budget was proposing all of these tax cuts, but it wasn't proposing how these were going to be funded. So you had a situation where the deficit was rising significantly mm-hmm. and the markets obviously were spooked by that. Mm-hmm. And that was reflected in what happened in the value of the pound, what happened to gilt markets mm-hmm. and what happened to the economy more generally. Mm-hmm. So I think that and this is what my article was getting at, is that in America, you're facing similar economic issues that we were having here with high interest rates and inflation. Right. And a tax cutting budget, although in principle is probably, you know, desirable and um, the right thing to do if the economic forces are against you mm-hmm. you cannot press ahead with those plans without you know paying credence to what's actually happening in the wider economy mm-hmm. so i think it's quite interesting going back to you know what you were saying about truth um that we saw here what happens when you don't adhere to realities and you try and exist on your own mm-hmm. plane of facts and your your own sort of ideology rather than trying to insert your principles into the real world and being pragmatic about these things. Mm-hmm. And um, and yeah, we had a situation where the, the markets went so bad that mm-hmm. firstly the Chancellor had to resign and then just a few days later the Prime Minister was gone and we had to right. uh, bring in a new one. Right. So, so um, it, it was uh, quite a clear warning really to other parts of the world that um, you do really have to exist in the real world. And I think that that's been reflected in a way in the midterm results that we've seen um, coming through today. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this, going back to Liz and, you know, I read in your article, you referred to Margaret Thatcher. Obviously everybody loved Maggie Thatcher. Do you think she was taking from her playbook, but the timing was just completely off? Yeah. So in a way, a very similar way to the mythology really around Reagan, where he's, you know, built up as this in, like he was a very successful figure and a very successful president, but it's built to something way beyond it ever was when he was in office. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what it is with Thatcher, except a lot of it is also um, not quite true. So um, he was actually quite a pragmatic politician. Her first few years in office were not defined by lots of tax cutting and deregulation that her later years were mm-hmm. defined by. Mm-hmm. She was all about sound money, balancing the books, that kind of thing, promoting confidence in the economy. And when it was in a strong enough position that you could start to bring these taxes down, that's when she did it. Liz Truss, however, tried to do this from the very beginning. So she tried to implement all of this tax cutting stuff, but the economic conditions weren't right. Right. Now, that's not an approach that that Thatcher would have actually taken in reality. She would have been much more pragmatic and she was much more pragmatic. So it was sort of this like, you know, poor comparison that Truss was making and this sort of poor version of, what Thatcher was, and and that's ultimately why it failed. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this. What is the state of affairs in the UK right now with all this constant change? You know, you had Queen Elizabeth passing in September. Mm. Then you saw the transitions and what was happening, you know, at 10 Downing Street. And Mm. so what does that look like right now? And is what is happening here in the state of economics of the United States how is that affecting the parliament and how is that affecting the UK? Yes, yeah, so um, there's essentially two reactions here. We've had the economic one and the political one. The political one has mostly calmed down now. We obviously had um, a period of great instability after that budget was announced by Trust, which ultimately resulted in her resignation. Mm-hmm. We've now had Rishi Sunak uh, elected as the prime minister within his own party and um, here, you don't have to face a general election to be the prime minister. You just have to be the leader of the largest party in parliament. Mm-hmm. So he is now the leader of that party. And um, there is pressure for there to be a general election, but that pressure has died down slightly in the last few weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that sort of political turmoil has definitely calmed down a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but the economic turmoil has not gone away at all. Mm-hmm. Um, we are facing much worse uh, inflation than the states, primarily because we don't have the same kind of energy security um, that you guys have over there. We are massive importers of energy, whereas I believe you're exporters of energy. Um, Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. that leaves us in a weaker position. And because of that fiasco around the budget, we're now in a weaker position and the new government is going to have another budget coming out um, next week, which is expected to be you know, tax raising, um, 
really the opposite of what they originally wanted to do. But now we're, you know, in that position where the government's got a huge black hole in their budget and they need to fill it. Mm-hmm. And they're going to fill it by raising taxes, which is obviously going to be painful for the rest of us. You would have thought they would have seen this coming. Just, you know, I have to throw that out there. Mm. It, it seems as though they're more of a, in a reactionary positioning than they are in a proactive approach. And they are working more. It sounds a lot like America. They're working more mm. in a deficit than a balanced budget. And it's, and it's taking away from the pockets of the American citizens. It's taking away from the UK and having money in your pockets. What are your thoughts? You know, I call uh, the current sitting person in, in the White House, oh, Biden, because I'm not sure really what to call it. And, you know, they continue to state that it is going to be a very dark winter. And so I ask you the same thing. Do you see that in that in your forecast in the UK because of I mean, do we place some blame on the United States for the lack of leadership because we are going to be having a dark winter? Do you think that? And then do you also see that in your forecast within the UK as well? Mm. Well, we, we're certainly also facing a dark winter, and I think it's primarily because of um, the situation in Ukraine, but also that, as you say, there's not been a lot of foresight. And this isn't, um, I don't think that, that the blame for that lays at the door of any one administration. We've had a decade or more of energy policy, which has not allowed us to be self-sufficient in energy, which has put us in a much weaker position. Mm-hmm. You've seen a similar thing in places like Germany and France, Mm-hmm. which has been a massive problem. So I think that when you get these sort of global crises that come along, it then leaves you in a much weaker position. So um, from, from the United States perspective, I see it in a similar way that it's not the, the failings of any one administration, but it's the failings of several, because mm-hmm. tensions have been heating up for a long, long time, particularly with Russia. And the invasion of Ukraine when it happened was not unexpected. Right. Um, there'd been warnings about it for several years that it was likely to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that the fact that there hasn't been more to sort of insulate um, European um, economies and the American economy as well from these um, pressures that were inevitably going to come down the line at some point mm-hmm. is a failing of multiple administrations in multiple countries. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that now we're in this position of playing catch up where we're trying to over here, we have to invest massively in things like renewable energy. Mm-hmm. so that we can have energy security, so that we're not relying on Russian gas to be able to heat our homes. Mm-hmm. And I think that um, I obviously know far more about that from the UK perspective than, you know, the, the longer standing policies of different American administrations. But I mm-hmm. think it's clear that it's it's not the issue of any one. I think it's many successive governments have failed to really have mm-hmm. that foresight to insulate their own economies from some of these potential pitfalls that were that were inevitably coming down the road. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this in regards to King Charles now being at um, in charge of the monarchy at this point. What are your feelings since the passing of the queen and his leadership and his role with now with parliament? And how does that look to have maybe potential greater proactive approaches as we head into um, this next generation? Honestly, Mm. Yeah, well, so for um, for the benefit of, of listeners that don't know too much about yes. um, our monarchy, we have a constitutional monarchy, which essentially means that they are a figurehead and they don't have much power. Mm-hmm. But different monarchs can kind of take different approaches. Mm-hmm. So you saw Queen Elizabeth for the 70 years that she was on the throne, never expressed political opinion on anything, mm-hmm. um, never even did so much as raise an eyebrow and sort of stayed above the fray of all of it. Charles is in a very different position because when he was the Prince of Wales and was next in line to the throne, he was quite active. Um, You know, he believed in causes like um, championing the environment and climate change and things like that. And we've seen a little bit of that since he's taken over. Like Mm -hmm. um, he's expressed interest in going to COP and being part of that as part of the British delegation, um, held a reception beforehand for... um, both British leaders, but also from neighbouring countries to come down. And I think that that is something you will see more from him is that certain issues that Mm -hmm. he's not going to wade into the day to day politics, but some of those safer issues where it's more that you're acting as, you know, the safeguard of the nation, the the figurehead of the nation, where you can gently support certain 
relatively non-controversial issues and express your support and use your position as the um, the figurehead of the nation to mm. exert that internationally. I think that's the role he'll play and he'll be more active in that sense than um, than Elizabeth was. But again, he he's not going to wade into day-to-day -day politics because... Mm. Um, right, that, it's not the role of the monarchy. Yes. Exactly, yes. exactly. That's not yes. how it happens in our system. Yes. You know, I've been watching, I have been watching the royal family since I was little, since, you know, he married Princess Diana. So that's really dating me. But I, I have studied the monarchy. I've had such a huge respect for Queen Elizabeth. I mean, World War II, active, you know, served in World War II, um, 70 years. And then just what a faith leader for the family and also for the nation. Mm. And then seeing that carry over into um, William and Catherine and their children and that and just the role that she played, especially with Catherine and what is mm. ahead for those next generations. What are your, you know, obviously we see it differently here in the United States, but what are your thoughts on William and Catherine and the next generation? Do you think it's going to be not to push, you know, King Charles out, but it doesn't seem to me it's going to be nearly as long as no. obviously his mother, right? No. So, so what do you think in, in regards of timing in that next generation focus? They're so focused on mental health. They're very mm. much focused on a lot of the social justice issues, you know, the human trafficking piece. What are your thoughts on what will be the next move, if you will, for the monarchy and just their leadership role within the country? Yeah, I think um, it's an interesting question because um, when you're on the throne for such a long time, you sort of define yourself when you're very young and that's how you carry yourself throughout. Whereas we've got with Charles and the same is the case with William and likely it would be the same um, with George as well, who would be next in line to the throne, um, that they will already be well defined and people know their opinions on a lot of things before they ever become the monarch. And so I think you're probably right in the sense that they are going to champion more causes. Um, yes. And you'll see more this this Charles model will be carried on through the next few generations. That mm -hmm. um, there will be certain issues that that are close to their hearts, certain charities that they will support, and they will sort of champion those issues in public life. Mm -hmm. But inevitably, when they do take the throne, a lot of that will have to go um, by the wayside, and they will have to be that sort of neutral arbiter sitting atop of the tree um, yeah. as a figurehead, but very little else. And I think that, um, you know, they they don't have the luxury that Elizabeth had of not being defined before they take that, take on that role. But um, inevitably, they will always stay above the fray um, of politics generally, even if there are specific causes and issues mm -hmm. um, that they champion from afar. Yes. Yes. Well, Callum Patton, I, I've already taken up more five more minutes than I had planned to talk with you, but I'm just, I love the UK. I loved being over there. I loved traveling over there. I loved experiencing everything about it, the history. As, let me ask you a final question mm -hmm. I have where people can follow you on social media. What do you have coming up next? What are some articles and some topics we can be looking for to maybe bringing you back? And what do you have on the radar? Yes. Yeah, so, um, I tend to write about and speak about a whole a whole range of stuff, sort of um, anything from from politics to economics, and and of course even a bit a little bit of law as well. So um, if anyone wants to to keep up with that, you can follow him, follow me on my Twitter, which is Peyton underscore Callum. Mm -hmm. On there, you'll see uh, information about the book that you mentioned earlier, yes. Yes. Um, and then any more articles or interviews that I'm doing, you'll be able to to see them over there, okay. and. Um, and the speaker as well, which is a, a platform that that I run. And uh, there's a lot of my writing on there if anyone ever wants to, to sort of keep up with any of that. Fabulous. Well, Callum Patton, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> thank America. you. I, I love Young Voices, and I'm so glad that you could come here and be, you know, thank you for being a contributor for the UK and just bringing your common sense to our show today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, sir. Thank you, you too. Thanks for having me on. All right. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. And for all those who are tuning in, this is Common Sense America. I am Eden Hill, and we just had a great contributor from Young Voices UK. I am just so grateful to have them on the show. They are just amazing. Uh, they bring great content, bring great commentary to Common Sense America.